It's great to be back with you and to see you. It takes about a year and a half now to get around the cycle. And uh, just looking at, at some of our reports as we approach assembly, and that's not a bad word, assembly, you know. I would encourage you to be a part of it this year. It looks like six or seven church plants in the last year, which, you know, we celebrate. We, we, that means a difference in people's lives and a renewal of some churches that have been around a long, long time. And uh, we're so grateful for that. Kirby, I, I think you're here, aren't you? Yeah, you are. Well, I didn't want to steal your thunder, but, you know, I, I remember just listening to Joe and the dedication of baby Grace and your commitment uh, to help her grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord reminded me of family camp and the children. And I've used, I've stolen the rope theme, uh, I think that Jeremy used, where, you know, you have the devil on one end of the rope and you have uh, a Christian on the other end of the rope and there's a constant tug of war going on all the time. And then, uh, uh, you know, you call for that little child's parents to stand behind her. And then you call for the pastor. And then you call for the board. And then you call for the congregation. And suddenly that imbalance isn't so much of an imbalance anymore. And uh, I, I just got that word picture this morning as you were talking that we surround uh, these kids. We surround our kids with a great cloud of witnesses, some of which are living and breathing this side of eternity and the great host, according to Hebrews, that are living and breathing on the other side of eternity. We celebrate that in a wonderful way. God bless you. Well, uh, today I, I thought that I would talk to you about meaningful worship. We've, we've had a lot of worship this morning. Um, and yet that's a contradiction to what I'm about to, to say. Worship is a word that describes a condition, not an event. Worship is a word that is not just inserted in a bulletin for a period of time in the service. It is a condition that we who follow Jesus live with and breathe every moment of our lives. Would you uh, stand with me as I read the word? And the word is from John's Gospel, chapter 17, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and verse 15. I'm going to take a little bit of a tour today, but I want to get the context of our, of our message established. John, chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 15, the words of Jesus, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too would be truly sanctified. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We are not heavenly beings. We are not supernatural beings. We are human beings. Last district assembly, I preached a message, which I'm not going to repeat today, but I will draw from the first part of it. That we need a clear understanding of who we are. That we are people of two kingdoms. And rather than that be an insult to our spiritual condition, it is a reality check of what we really are. We are people of one Lord. And we are people of no compromise. This whole idea of being a human being actually becomes more vivid I think the older we get. I think the younger we are, especially if you're a young person with a newfound faith in Christ, there's a, a sense of uh, being invincible. There's a sense of, you know, we can do it. We can take this challenge. We can win this victory. We can uh, overthrow Jericho if we just walk around the walls enough times and chant 
enough times. And the older you get, the more mature you get, the more exposure you have to humanity, the more we realize just how human we are. For while we are not supernatural beings or heavenly beings or angelic beings, God takes human beings, the human beings that he made, remember, the human beings that he fully understands, the human beings that he can heal, the human beings that he can develop, the human beings through which he can perform miracles. And we are the ones he prays for. This amazing John chapter 17 is really all about that. It's, it's not just praying for super saints. It's not just praying for the super churched. It is a prayer for human disciples who brought their humanity into the kingdom of God. Humanity must never be left at the door. It must always be brought into the sanctuary of God. And we're going to track that a little bit through the prophet Isaiah in a few moments. But this humanity brings with it history. It brings with it tradition. It, it brings with it our preconceived ideas. It brings with it what has been put into our minds and into our hearts. And we must do battle with those things. We are not just human beings who have failed, because that's what we are. We are fallen humanity. But we are human beings with wonderful talents. We are wonderfully made. We are fearfully made. You look at the people who do never claim to have a relationship with God or with Jesus. You can't deny the talents that artists have or musicians have. We can't deny the talents that people in the art world have. We, we can't deny that. There are some geniuses. There are terrific scientists and mathematicians. They are brilliant people. And there is not a clash between the spiritual and the human. Rather, there is a harmony of those things. There is a symphonia is, is the word that is used to bring these two things together. It's where we get our word symphony. What happens when you go to the symphony? You know, you, we go to it, but we really don't go to it. We, we are a part of it. And, and you listen to the combination of all of the instruments in the orchestra. You listen to the combination of all of the voice parts in a choir. You listen to the combination of all of those things that come together in their places. You, you listen in the modern world to the combination of uh, audio materials that have been recorded at different times in different places. Not the least of which is contemporary artists who can actually sing a song with dead people. You can have a song from Nat King Cole, who doesn't live on this earth anymore, and that can be sung by, uh, with his daughter uh, in a duet. You, you can bring these things together in a wonderful way. How do we do that? Do we do that because we're somehow inept? No, we can do that because we're somehow brilliant. We can do that because God has given human beings the ability to think and to reason. And I would be the last person and I hope you are also the last well we can't have two last you be second last <laughs> to deny the harmony between the human and the spiritual never deny that but embrace it because that only enhances the miracle of salvation it actually enhances the miracle of salvation it does not take away from it in the slightest and so we have Jesus who is reminding all of us, not just the disciples, that he is praying for us. We who are in the world, we who face the struggles and the trials. Just like the lady that uh, I met yesterday at the Sharing Place annual meeting. And you're going to meet her at District Assembly. Her name is Jasmina. And there she was with her little baby. A very special name. And you'll hear that at District Assembly. Jasmina was uh, embarrassed because she was found to be with child. 
She uh, came from the Caribbean uh, to Toronto, a new life. She became pregnant. She has this little life inside of her. The father disappeared, didn't want anything to do with her now that she was pregnant. And Jasmina at uh, a loss for meaning and identity in this world arrives at the sharing place. She came there because she needed food. She came there because she needed clothing. She came there because she was desperate. Well, when she came there, she found something that she didn't expect to find. She found welcome. She found that just as she is a human being with challenges and needs, so there were other human beings who responded to her humanity. They clothed her. They gave her something uh, to eat. But they also presented Jesus to her, one whom she accepted. And through the pregnancy, difficulties began to surface. And so uh, she went to Sick Kids Hospital and she went to Mount Sinai Hospital and they discovered that a few months into her pregnancy, I think six months into her pregnancy, that her baby had uh, development deficiencies, uh, major development deficiencies in her brain. In that, half of her brain had not developed. Half of her brain was uh, filled with holes. And at that point in time, the, the experts told her that there was no hope of this growing in. You know, you, you think that in that embryonic, in that fetus condition, that all right, it's not fully developed yet, so there's still time for this to happen. No, she was beyond that stage. So uh, now it was time for the suggestion. It certainly must not have been six months, but I can't quite remember. It, it's time now for you to think about uh, having an abortion. Now, lest you think that I'm on a rant and a rave about abortion, I'm not. Let me just settle that once and for all. It's just part of the story. And so she just felt that in this newfound faith, in her love for God, that she, she wasn't going to do this. In her love for her baby, she was not going to do this but decided that she would carry the baby full term and deal with whatever consequences uh, she would have to deal with. She came to the sharing place again and again and again. And Pastor Octavio Torres, who is now with the Lord, a year ago now, can you believe it? He's now with the Lord. And Pastor Gina laid hands on Jasmina and prayed a prayer of healing and belief that God would touch this little baby. And uh, she believed also. She believed. And the baby was born. And she was at the Sharing Place annual meeting yesterday with the baby in her arms. And the final report from Mount Sinai Hospital, which said this, apart from the medical jargon that I can't remember, the bottom line in our terms was this, there is no abnormality in the brain of this child. There is no reason for her to continue to be monitored by our staff. This is a letter of release. <coughs> and I sat there and I looked at this child and I looked at that mother and it would be as if heaven and earth began to rejoice. It was as if the whole sky erupted with sounds of rejoicing that God had touched a human being. God had touched a human being of all people, who was to be born out of wedlock. That God somehow had interrupted the normal spiritual scheme of things to fulfill his purpose on earth, and that is to redeem humanity. To redeem humanity with our fallenness and with our frailties and with our sin and with our mistakes and with all of those things. The message of God is that I love you in spite of everything. That I love you. And not only do I love you, but I know what you live in. I know that you are people of two kingdoms. I know that you are part of the kingdom of heaven. But I also know that you have to live that out in the kingdom of earth. 
And that is why, says Jesus, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Think about that. The, the prayers of Jesus for every one of us. There are tremendous praying churches around this district, around our two districts, Quebec and Ontario. There are tremendous prayer warriors. But I will take the prayers of Jesus over the prayers of anybody else any day. And I don't mean that as an insult. When I read that Jesus is praying for me, that goes right to the top of my favorites list. That goes right to the top of my list. And that prayer never, ever, ever stops. We bring our humanity into the kingdom of God. And Jesus loves it. He loves it because God sent his humanity into the world in the form of Jesus. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. He took upon himself our form. What an example that is. What a message that is. And so today as we look at this little human being that didn't cry in my arms but cried in her granddad's arms. When you look at that little baby, that human being, and we dedicate that human being to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is far more than words could ever describe what it is. That is far more. There's a lot between the lines in what we did today. Who are we? We are human beings. We are beautiful. We are different. We are risky. We are unpredictable. We sometimes don't know what we're doing. But that's who we are and will never be anything else. Do you hear that? We'll never be anything else. Folk theology says that when we die, we suddenly become angels and we get our wings. I'd like to read that somewhere because I wouldn't mind believing that. I wouldn't mind taking that on in my next life. You know, I, I would, uh, you know, do I want fixed wings? Do I want propellers? Do I, what do I want? You know, we are human beings. And when we enter into the kingdom of heaven and we pass through those pearly gates, we go in there as a redeemed human, a redeemed human. And we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Human beings have a hard time dealing with the one we are called to worship. Human beings face tragedy all the time. If you go to the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah, you'll find one who we see as a great prophet struggling, struggling so much with this whole idea of humanity. In the sixth chapter, the prophet says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The interesting thing about that chapter is that he only saw the Lord high and lifted up in his desperate condition. It was the year that King Uzziah died. It was a time of tremendous loss. Uzziah was his uncle or his cousin. Commentaries have it different. And it was in a moment of meaningful worship that I hope you experience every Sunday in this church. Meaningful worship that I hope you experience every day in your life. It was in a moment of meaningful worship that Isaiah actually became the person that God really wanted him to be. I said at the beginning that meaningful worship is not merely the first 25 or 30 minutes in a, in a service. Me meaningful worship is, is not the way we plan our program. Thanks for giving me an hour and a half, by the way. <laughs> Did I read that wrong? Yes. <laughs> meaningful worship is not trying to get all of the songs to match the theme of the pastor's message. Meaningful worship is not the repetition of worship songs and hymns. Meaningful worship uh, is the condition of the human being before an awesome God. That's meaningful worship. And that can take place in your car. It can take place in your workplace. It can take place in your church, in your sanctuary, in your Sunday school class. It can take place everywhere. 
But here is a stark reality. Jim Simbola, in uh, his book entitled Storm, he did some research in churches, and here's what he found, that 46% of people who go to church on a regular basis, they say that their lives have not been changed at all by the worship experience in the church. Nearly half of the people who go to church on a regular basis, in other words, come in and go out untouched, untouched by meaningful worship, untouched by the fact that God is in this place, untouched by the reality that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Now that is a tragedy. It's a tragedy when you compare that against the experiences of the New Testament and the early church. It's a tragedy when you compare that against the experiences of the Old Testament, which were primarily in the desert or in the wilderness or some other place that you would not necessarily describe as a place of worship. And if this is true, then it violates the very first tenet of the Westminster Confession, the Catechism of the Presbyterian Church. The first question is, what is the chief end of man? In other words, why are we here? The answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To enjoy him forever. The idea of just enjoying God when we die and get to heaven is actually false doctrine the reality of the believer is that we can enjoy God in this present world and in any condition the enjoyment of God as the prophet said was breathtaking it was breathtaking and I would argue that every meaningful experience should be breathtaking it it should take your breath away God is really here, and, and, and God is really here to speak to me, and God is really here, and I need to give him my full attention and my worship, and it doesn't matter what I wear, it doesn't matter uh, how I look, that God is here, and that's all there is to it. Somehow, if we could get that feeling back into our churches and congregations and boards and Sunday school classes and small groups that we're not just meeting to make us better for the three score and ten years that we've been given on this earth. No, no we're actually here uh, because God's here. And whether we're better or not is secondary to the primary reality that we're here in the presence of God. It's God's job then to make us better. It's not the pastor's job. It's not my job. It's not the latest Bible study book's job. It's God's job to make us better. And he will if we allow him his rightful place. And that is that he's worthy of honor and worthy of praise. Which is manifested in many ways. It'll be manifested in what we do in a few moments with regard to the Lord's Supper. It's manifested from the opening call to worship and the scripture that was read today. It's manifested in the singing. It's manifested in the playing. Manifested in the piano, in the offertory. But let me tell you where it is most manifested. It is manifested when we stop at that back door before we cross the threshold and we say, Lord, I'm here to worship you. And it doesn't matter if the pastor plays flat notes. It doesn't matter if his sermon is horrible. It doesn't matter if he's not wearing a tie. It doesn't matter if his haircut is really odd. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter if he can bench press 200 pounds. Oh, he's going to correct me now. How many? 275. You see? It doesn't matter if he's proud. We're here to worship you, Lord. We're, we're here to worship you. That's all. And whenever we walk out that door, we're walking with you. 
but we're going home with you. And tomorrow when we wake up, we're going to worship you in every way and in everything that we do. And this was the experience of the prophet. Meaningful worship. He went into church. Remember, this is the context. He went into the temple and he went in with Uzziah on his mind. It's interesting to see what happened here. And if you get nothing else out of this message, please get this. As soon as Isaiah the prophet saw God, he never mentioned Uzziah again. He never mentioned it again. Now some might think, well, that's a little disrespectful. How can you suddenly just move on? But when we see God, it's not just a matter of moving on. It's a matter of moving up to give a new perspective on Uzziah. So whether or not he ever mentioned him again, maybe the need not to mention Uzziah again took on much less significance than the need to mention him before he went to church. In seeing God, suddenly the problem was not as large. Suddenly the issue was not as dangerous or sad or life-threatening. There was a different perspective on the same issue. And that's what meaningful worship does. I love this chorus. And uh, Jason, it's one we used to sing at Emmanuel. It's so old school, you probably don't even know it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And then listen. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of of his glory and grace. Some of you do know it. Praise be to God. You do know it. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Let nobody else take his place so that hour by hour, not just one hour in church, but hour by hour you may know his power till at last you have run the great race. That chorus was born in the heart of somebody who knew what it was to enjoy meaningful worship, the rediscovery of the transcendence of God that really had only two words of response. And the two words of response were, Oh God. Oh God. My breath is taken away. This this is an awesome place. Further back in the Old Testament... The story of Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai, before their names were changed. They could not have children, but God had promised them an heir. God had promised them that he would bless them through their offspring. And yet, in advanced years, the offspring didn't happen. So, Sarah suggested to Abraham, why don't you go with Hagar, our servant, And see what happens. Maybe she'll be able to provide us an offspring. That was accepted uh, practice in the day, by the way. It wasn't as jaw-dropping as it might be today, but, but that was accepted culturally back in the day. And so he did. He slept with her, and they had a child, Ishmael, the father of the Ishmaelites, the firstborn, but not the promise. And yet the one to whom God said, I will also make you a a mighty nation. So now you've got this divergence. You've got Isaac, who is the promised one, who came much later than Ishmael. But you've got the two. And as soon as Ishmael was born, Sarah, the one who thought it was a good idea for Abraham to do that, said, you need to get rid of her. She's really annoying me now, so you need to put her out. You you need to get her out of this place. And so she goes, actually. She she knows she's not wanted. There are two stages to the departure of Hagar. So, So she goes and she runs. And she runs and she runs. And where does she run? She runs towards Egypt where she had come from in the first place. She was a servant. She was a bought, hired hand, if you like, from Egypt. And on her way back, and we know she was trying to get back home because... The biblical record gives us a geographical river that is very close to the border with Egypt. And in that moment where she's there, the angel of the Lord comes upon her. Where are you going? Where are you going, Hagar? Well, I, I, yeah, you don't need to tell me the story. I want you to go back. I want you to go back where you belong. 
I'm going to be with you. The presence of the Lord, meaningful worship by some obscure river in the wilderness in southern Israel, back to the house of Abraham and Sarah. And so she did. Until Isaac is born. And Ishmael, who is now a little older, maybe even a teenager, begins to mock the birth of Isaac. And that really annoys Sarah. And Sarah said, now, now, now she's gone this time. This is it. You're putting her out. So Abraham, he puts her out. And Hagar and Ishmael are out of the house. Ishmael is about to die. She can't even watch her son die. So the Bible says she goes a bow's length. I don't know what that is, but a bow's length away from where her son is sitting, dying in the wilderness with no water to drink. No water to drink. And the angel of the Lord comes to her again. The underdog. The one who isn't supposed to see the favor of God. The angel of the Lord, often in scripture described, or describing God, by the way, comes to her and says, I have seen your boy. Not I've heard your prayer. Because there's no indication that Hagar was even praying. But I have seen your boy. You can't look at him. You don't want to watch him dying, but, but I've seen him. And I'm going to bless him. And from him there will be a mighty nation. Why do you think we have trouble in our world today? Because there are two people, Isaac and Ishmael, who have both been promised to be mighty nations. One the father of, and the other the father of. And in that moment, a miracle happens that I call meaningful worship. God opened Hagar's eyes to see a well that was sitting there David Busick, in his book, Perfectly Imperfect, suggests that that well was always there, that God could have created a well in a nanosecond. He could have done it right there, but he believes that that well was always there. Hagar just couldn't see it because of her own grief and because you can't see the forest for the trees. She took the wine skin, she filled it with water, gave it to Ishmael, and he grew, and he grew into be a mighty nation. Wow. In the midst of all of this story, there's one, if not more, significant moment. And it's the words of Hagar where she says, I now see the God who has always seen me. You talk about meaningful worship. That will be Isaiah's story as well, going up into the temple. I now, I now see the God who has always seen me. Is that the story of us Nazarenes? We're finally at 100 plus years old. We're saying, I now see the God who has always seen me. The modern day church, would we be shouting this from the rooftops? I now see the God who has always seen me. That is meaningful worship. Whether it's a wilderness, a desert, by the side of a river, in a temple in the Old Testament, in a synagogue in the New, or a church in the modern dispensation. Meaningful worship. It's not a part of what we do. It's a condition of who we are. I now see the God who has always seen me. I pray that Grace and the other kids one day, you were very clear in the back office that you believe in believer's baptism. That one day that will come for those kids where they will see the God who has always seen them. And for all of our kids, ours included. An old man who was frustrated with, uh, frustrated with his church and didn't know how to voice it, suddenly stood up in the midst of a morning worship service and prayed, oh God, do something that's not in the bulletin. <laughs> well, you don't have a bulletin, so we don't have to worry about that. And that's all right. I'm not going to save in paper. Good, steward. God, do something that's not on the cards. Do something that's not in the bulletin. Do something that we weren't even expecting. 
so that I get a new glimpse of you, high and lifted up, with your train filling the temple. Pastor, you're the shepherd of this flock, and I want you to take it now where you think it should go. God bless you.